We're live. G'day, bodgies and widgies, and welcome to this live stream. Uh, I believe we have started on time. We'll wait just a few minutes for everyone to get in, but basically, I just want to go over a little bit of housekeeping. I know you guys are really amazing when it comes to live streams, but um, this topic that I wanted to talk about today um, is kind of a series that I've planned to do in the future for live streams. And uh, basically, today we're going to talk all about cosmetic aquarium surgery. Now, the reason that I wanted to do this type of live stream where we cover, I guess, controversial or topics in the aquarium hobby that aren't really covered is because um, they're not covered. It's I think it's always important to cover both sides of something. So we always see a lot of great things when it comes to the aquarium hobby, um, innovations, things that we've achieved, species that we've conserved. But I guess there's never really much focus when it comes to, um, I guess, the more darker sides of the aquarium hobby or topics that when you bring up conversation with someone will generally go either one, they agree with you or one or two, they will completely disagree with you. So I guess um, this topic is kind of falls in one of those little categories, but it's always good to, um, good to talk about them. Another thing that um, I want to kind of address is the reason I wanted to make this a live stream is because I would totally appreciate your input when we um, talk about some of the topics that I have planned for today. Uh, I could have made this a video and then answered your comments, but by having an interactive audience where I can both um, ask questions and receive answers plus your input as well uh, is going to be very much appreciated. And also because it is a live audience, we may have differing views with some of the things that I will be talking about today. So if that is the case, uh, let's try and keep this as professional as possible. Uh, this isn't something that I really have to say. I know you guys will be uh, tip-top behavior, but um, just something that I wanted to address, I guess, as, uh, as rules or housekeeping. This is a safe space, so uh, you know, if you are going to share something, try and make it uh, professional. So cool. Let's get right into it. We'll do a quick catch up of the chat. Uh, Mad P, hello. Uh, I'm doing great. Maddie D, thank you for joining in. And thank you for all the people that, uh, uh, I guess, uh, haven't made themselves aware in the, in the chat. So, you know, if you do, make sure that you do say hi. Um, and, you know, to, yeah. So let's get right into it. Aquarium cosmetic surgery. Now, this is a term that some people may have heard, some people may not have heard. So I guess to define it in basic terms, cosmetic surgery is what we do, I guess, in humans to make ourselves look better. And that's exactly the same term when it comes to aquariums. Aquarium cosmetic surgery is a practice of, um, I guess, changing the physical appearance of a fish in order to achieve some desirable traits or make it look better. And Sometimes it can go really well, other times it can go really bad, and there's also a very fine line when it comes to what's ethical and what isn't ethical. What kind of surgical practices can we do and what kind of surgical practices can we not do? The fact that we're dealing with fish here, we can't really get consent from them, so um, that's always a bit of a problem. And we're still kind of on the fence about whether fish can feel pain or have feelings or things like that. So I guess when we look at a human point of view, a surgeon can't really go up to a random stranger and do plastic surgery on them. But in our case, we are the sole owners of our fish, so we get to make that decision of whether we want to do that or not. So to give people, I guess, a proper example of where aquarium cosmetic surgery or these kind of practices happen is, uh, let me get up a picture, which is a fish that you guys will be very familiar with. This here is the Asian arowana. Now, Asian arowana are by far one of the world's most expensive aquarium fish. And they're, they're deemed to be this beautiful fish that can bring a lot of, um, uh, I guess, uh, like luxury and uh, wealth to people. So whenever people get Asian arowana, they see them as kind of an investment. They spend a lot of time into grooming this fish 
and making it look better or trying to make it look to the best of their abilities. And in doing so, sometimes it requires cosmetic surgery to be done on these fish. Uh, and that can involve a multitude of things like fanning, uh, which, uh, which is a process which is done on the fins, which we will look at uh, a little bit more in detail. So fanning, we've got tanning lights, which really brings out the color of the fish and a couple of other things like removing scales in order to promote growth and things of that sort. Another time we see cosmetic surgery really taking place in aquariums with Asian arowana is through drop eye correction surgery. So you'll see the silver arowana here, um, a very beautiful fish, but when you see the eye, it's tilted down low. And this can sometimes put strain on the nerves and the fish itself because a fish like an arowana, which has always got eyesight, which is meant to be looking up, has now had its eye turned down. And this can happen through a majority of reasons. The exact cause yet or still yet has not been specified. So um, people or aquarists have come through experience to, um, I guess, come to the conclusion that it's EU that Either. It's usually through food. So if you feed your arowana a lot of fatty foods, that can cause um, fat to build up behind the eye and cause the eye to kind of bulge out. Or if you've got issues in your water quality or if the arowana is being distracted by things at the bottom of the aquarium, um, a whole bunch of different theories that haven't exactly been proven yet. However, drop eye is an issue that we see very, very regularly with a lot of captive bred silver arowana. It's also prevalent in Asian arowana, just not as much. So my personal theory is I believe it's genetics because if we see it with wild silver arowana, it's, it doesn't happen. However, captive arowana, we see it happening a lot. Okay. So, um, that's a whole other topic, but um, yeah, drop eye. So in order to correct this, a lot of times what um, I guess a lot of experienced aquarists will do is sedate their arowana through clove oil or some sort of anesthetic, take the arowana out, and they will uh, actually, uh, what they'll do, one second, what they'll actually do is remove the fat behind the eye. So you can see here, this, you can see here, we've got uh, just a small, I guess, surgical scissor and that's used to just cut the skin behind the eye. And then what will happen is that, um, <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm just using something new at the time being, but what will happen is they'll actually remove the fat. So as you can see there, they cut around the skin first and then they'll use twiz tweezers, <laughs> tweezers. They use tweezers and scissors to cut out and pull the fat out. So um, by doing so, what will happen is that once the arowana, uh, I guess, um, has that fat removed, the eye will just go back to normal. So you'll see, um, again, so with this Asian arowana, how it has drop eye. Once you remove that fat and the eye, or there isn't this volume behind the eye to, I guess, push the eye out, the Asian arowana will hopefully go back to normal. So you see this. Um, and this is a very common practice that you see with, a lot of people that have pride in their Asian arowana and they want it to look the best. Even with this arowana on screen, you can see that it does have a little bit of drop eye present. And um, I, I am completely coming to the conclusion that it's probably through genetics and food. Now that we've got that done, let's have a quick uh, catch up of the chat. Alice KH, hello, thank you for joining in. Mad P, I bought a female guppy today and just realize it is pregnant. Now I have to buy a separation box because my angels will probably eat the babies. What you can do, I guess, is um, just get a Tupperware container and usually you can kind of wedge it into the corner of the aquarium and put the female guppy in there for the time being just to protect those fry. Um, already have two males and five females hoping they breed more yeah guppies especially with um if you crank the temperature up a little bit they will be uh, a lot more uh, susceptible to breed um the temperature really speeds up the metabolism blake's aquatics hello thank you for joining in uh blake did really help me out with uh trying to get these little pictures and things to pop up and a lot of the um technical stuff regarding the stream so massive thank you for that 
does this occur in the wild? Now, as far as I've seen and having spent a lot of time researching, reading, watching arowanas um, and experience keeping them as well, uh, I've found that with a lot of wild arowana, this probably won't happen. Majority of reasons, like we said, diet, genetics, and also uh, their environment. So when you see Asian ar uh, silver arowana and Asian arowana in the wild, their, uh, I guess their vision is always looking up to find their next meal. So um, I find that they don't generally have these, um, these kind of drop eye problems in the wild. So yeah, in order to combat this, like I did show, they would do a lot of drop eye removal or drop eye correction surgery. The next thing that I find very common um, as a surgical practice done with, again, Asian arowana is fanning. So fanning is basically when they get the fins of an Asian arowana and they'll take a small surgical needle and just split every single, or I guess little sections of the fin. So as you can see in this picture, the fin is currently like this. And what will happen or what will supposedly happen is that as the fin heals, it will actually develop more fin or webbing, I guess, to go in between these sections. So if you've got a fin like this, so if you've got a fin like this and you fan it out like that and it heals, now you've got a fin this big. And if you do it again, it'll get this big and this big. So um, they do that for purely aesthetic reasons in order to get the fin nice and big. So when the arowana swims, it looks more graceful and it flows and things like that. Is it ethical or is it safe? That's uh, something that we'll get a little bit later into this uh, into this live stream. Now, I do plan on only keeping this live stream to run for about an hour just so we can get things covered in that uh, short amount of time, just so it's precise and to the point. Um, but, yeah, fanning is something that uh, is, a, is a very common surgical practice that does happen. Another one that we see is scale removal. Now, this one, and I'll, we'll get to my personal opinion a little bit later, but this practice here that we see is where the fin, or sorry, the fin, the scale of the Asian arowana is removed. And this could be for a multitude of reasons. With this one specifically, it's because there is a very, very small chip in the scale. Again, this is purely for aesthetic reasons. There is no, I guess, biological or survival benef benefit for the fish by removing the scale, um, uh, purely for aesthetic reasons. Now, um, yeah, like I said, the scale does have a chip in it. When we look at, and well, how do I word this? What I, or my personal view on this is, I think it's okay to do a surgical practice on a fish if it does benefit or if it benefits the fish in terms of survival now or making it live more comfortable. If we see drop-eye surgery, I would personally be comfortable with a fish getting that done just because imagine if you had to spend the rest of your life looking down, just straight down and you can't move your eyes anywhere else. That would put tremendous strain on your nerves, your optical nerves at the back of your eye. Um, and over time, I feel like it would just lead to the arowana becoming stressed um, and leading to a couple of issues like that. And it's purely because, or I think it's okay to do, purely because it aids with the life of the fish. However, when it comes to fanning and removal of scales, that's done purely for aesthetic reasons. It's an invasive procedure that happens on the fish. Though it doesn't really result in in the fish, I guess, taking any physical damage, it does mean that that specific point in time, the fish has to go through stress. Um, you having to take out the fish, give it anesthetic, and then you know do the procedure, put it back. There's a lot of room for error if you're not completely thoroughly practiced with this, um, and and. And there is, like I said, a, a, a very big room of error. If you overdose anesthetic, that is a $3,000 fish. Not even price aside, that is a fish, that is a life 
that has lost because of your action. So these are, these are I guess, um, aspects of um, cosmetic surgery where things get a little bit muddled. Uh, if we do a quick look at the chat, what kind of cosmetic things can you do slash what do people do on smaller fish? Okay, uh, now reasons why that is a great question. When it comes to cosmetic surgery on smaller fish, I haven't seen it as prevalent. I think it's mainly because of price. When you look at the effort or time that people take on an Asian arowana, it's a lot more effort and time because it's a $3,000 fish. However, when it comes to a fish like a guppy, the maximum you're spending on that is maybe around $50 for a pair. Um, and with when you look at fancy fish like fancy guppies or even shrimp, they purely work based on genetics. So, um, you know, if the genetic strain is okay and things like that, or I guess working on the genome of that fish is when you truly get those varying colors and thin structure and stuff like that. However, if it's possible on an Asian arowana, I do think it's possible on a fish like a guppy. Is it ethical? That's a different story. I personally think that it isn't. Um, doing a little bit of a catch up on the chat, Cooper's Aquatics, a bit inhumane, don't you think? Personally, completely agree with that. Um, like I said, though, when it comes to dropper eye correction surgery, if it makes the life of the fish better, then yes. However, there is also that risk involved of the fish or of that surgery going completely wrong. So um, there is always that risk that you should 100% consider. And ultimately it comes to, do you want to provide that little bit of a better life for your fish or are you okay to take the risk and I guess improve its life, you know, but there is a chance, a, quite a high chance that you lose your fish. Um, and, and that is the very fine line when it comes to, um, when it comes to this stuff. Another practice, which I see again with Asian arowana, I'm using this as an example because you see it far too often. Um, pretty much every single Asian arowana that has been kept in captivity by an owner will at one point or another have some form of cosmetic surgery done on it. This one, however, is, uh, isn't as physical. You're not exactly taking the fish and slicing and dicing it, you know, if, if you get what I mean. You're not exactly physically touching the fish or removing anything or adding anything to it, um, things like that. This is a practice called tanning. And what that is is, you get uh, some UV lights, strap it to the side of the aquarium, and those lights constantly hitting the scales of the fish will tan the fish. Basically what happens to humans, if we go to the beach uh, and sit out in the sun for about an hour, we will get tan. And that's exactly the same practice that happens with Asian marijuana. The reason because they want the fish to look better, purely aesthetic reasons. However, this I also feel falls into that category of isn't really that ethical because when you look at this aquarium specifically, you've got two two lights, and again, these are strong, powerful UV lights, and that is going on the tank. There's not really any dark spots or space for the fish to kind of rest from these bright lights being shined at its eyes. And you know, if you again take into a human example, if I was to take an LED light and put it this close to my face and have it just staying there for for days on end, that would cause some serious damage. And that's exactly what I feel like is happening to these Asian marijuana. An LED light, I feel like, wouldn't cause as much damage when you compare it to a UVB light. That's going to cause a lot of permanent damage. So, again, not very, and not very much an ethical practice, purely done for aesthetic reasons. And... Um, and yeah, this is something that I, I do feel quite uncomfortable with looking at. And I do want to also, with with all these things I'm showing you, please do give me your input in the uh, in the comment section below, uh, the comment section in the in the chat feed. Okay, so going uh, looking at the chat again, are you more of a tropical 
uh, are you more of a tropical water fish person or a cold water fish person? I am very much a tropical fish person. I love keeping tropical fish just because with the simple addition of a heater, you can open your options to hundreds, if not thousands of different aquarium species. So, um, yeah. Maddie D asks, so is there anything similar to flower horns? Okay, when it comes to flower horns, I feel like, again, it's very much like guppies um, and fish like that. Well, flower horn breeding and, and the way those colours and things are achieved is is purely through genetics. Um, a lot of, I guess, getting one set of parents, seeing how their fry look, getting the best-looking babies, breeding them together and continuing on. Though that does result in a lot of terrible genetic strains, it's the way that we're getting a completely man-made fish look as beautiful as a flower horn does. I personally think that flower horns are a very pretty looking fish depending on specific attributes. Uh, a lot of people, I guess, um, don't exactly share that view. Some, it's a love or hate relationship when it comes to flower horns. But again, I don't think I've personally ever seen any cosmetic practices being done on flower horns like tanning or um, what do you call it, fanning the fins or drop eye correction surgery, um, things like that. Now, like reasons why I asked before, can you do these practices on aquarium fish? Yes. Uh, on, on any aquarium fish, yes. If I wanted to, I could get a tanning light and put it just above with my Fluval 3.0 and I would see some noticeable effects. And I guess that is, again, a very fine line of where in, in this photo that we, that we still have on the screen, I'm just readjusting myself a little bit. When we see this photo that we have on the screen, these are two tanning lights that are going across the side of the aquarium. However, if I was to maybe just have one on the top, will the effects be the same? No. But will you see a little bit of minute differences Possibly, yes. But would I personally do it? Not really. However, if I was to get my Roseland sharks, put them in an aquarium by themselves, and just keep the tanning lights on the top, will their colours be way more phenomenal than they look now? Absolutely, 100%. And mind you, the four big Roseland sharks in my aquarium are wild-caught Roseland sharks. And I have seen a Roseland which, um, which was in Bali, and that was a beautiful looking Roseland because it was getting direct sunlight. So that UV light is coming through the sun, which I guess is natural um, and and isn't really, I guess, I guess invasive. That was a very beautiful looking fish. Do, did I want to replicate that? Yes, but do I think it's ethical? No, not really. Uh, the chat has taken a bit of a leap, so let's... Um, Let's take a quick look. <clears throat> Just to play devil's advocate, how do we know that UV actually bothers the fish? Great question. Uh, I guess we don't. We, we completely don't. There's, I, I feel like there hasn't been enough long-term scientific research that's gone into proving that UV light does not affect fish in a negative way. Um, however, I guess if we compare... The effects of UV light on humans, clearly you've got tanning, overexposure to UV will cause melanoma or skin cancer. Uh, if you look directly at the sun, it'll make you go blind. So when we take these aspects, if it affects a human, like we're a giant being, I'm pretty sure it would have very similar effects on a fish. So that's the thing that makes me feel very uncomfortable with some of the practices that we've seen here. Nevaeh, why don't people just accept the fish the way it is or just not get one at all? Seriously, these are creatures and every single one with its own characteristics. Just let them be as nature has them. Completely justifiable view. Um, makes completely, com complete sense. Um, and, and, yeah, that's, I guess, how I kind of personally see things. If I don't have to change or I'm getting a fish based on the way it looks, and a lot of every fish in this aquarium, I've got fish that look that have some amazing popping colors to fish that have these kind of subtle browns and blacks, completely different colors. And I'm, I'm perfectly happy with that. I love the way they look. That 
unique color, that wild type color that they have, I very much appreciate. So, um, yeah, I, I do completely agree that point that you're coming from. It's not like a human being that needs their nose fixed because it was broken and disfigured. <laughs> Justifiable point. Um, reasons why says a lot of time people don't want a naturalistic fish as people in real life want to be perfect people want their prized fish to be perfect yeah that's I guess when we look at Asian arowana like I did say it's a prized fish they want it to look perfect however as Nevaeh said there should be a stronger I guess focus to admire the fish at its natural beauty and I guess a lot of this does have to do with competition, media, uh, and other people's influences. Of course, if I was to get a red Asian arowana, illegal in Australia, but hypothetically, if I was to get a red Asian arowana and it grew, you know, 30 years with me, but it looked more orange and my, my mate got a red Asian arowana, he did a whole bunch of grooming and cosmetic practices to it. And when I saw his Asian arowana 30 years down the line and it was this bright, blood red, absolute show-stopping fish, well, we, we've come to believe, we've been groomed to believe that that bright red is a show-stopping fish. But, you know, if I did see his fish and it was bright red, of course, I'd naturally feel jealous or um, regret that I didn't do similar practices. So it's... Kind of, I guess now we reach into societal values and views on um, on fish keeping and and how there are some some not so ethical or acceptable views. Uh, looking a little bit more down the chat, this also comes into the topic of non naturalistic scapes being the way we want them to look as good as possible by not being naturalistic in some circumstances. That is another thing that I very much don't really like about this hobby. I mean, if you're going to do an aquascape that's, you know, th that you would never find in nature, 110% go for it. But would I be comfortable putting fish in there? Not really. And that's why a lot of these scapes you see, or a lot of professional or high-end aquascapes you see, will only have a minimal amount of fish, just like tetras, um, something that won't really care about its environment, uh, just kind of swim and, and eat. However, if I was to put a fish like a roseline shark in some of these grand prize IAPLC winning aquariums, I, I wouldn't be comfortable about it because it just takes away from the behavior that you see these fish display. But that's another topic um, going... Again, reading the chat, there is a difference between making that decision for ourselves as opposed to making that decision for another creature. Again, completely justifiable. If I was to make that, if I was to go and make that aquascape completely you know, high end, make these crazy valleys and things like that, um, something that you'd never see remotely close to nature, we should be the ones that make that decision of is it safe to put that fish in that aquarium and will it have a proper life? Or, um, you know, are we going to take the greater good of the fish first uh, and not put the fish in there? Some practices, such as Bozzy was saying, are, accept as, are acceptable, as well as some aren't. My view is if it doesn't hurt the fish, it's acceptable. The creature is an environment. Yep. How Ming Ju, is this... Uh, Strictly about drop eye. No, no, no. We're, we've still got half an hour and there's still a lot of topics that we're going to cover. Um, Blake's Aquatics. What about tattooed fish? You're a smart one, Blake. <laughs> that is a topic that we're going to be covering. Disgusting practice, 100%. Some people find drop eye and stuff undesirable. Completely. Um, aesthetically, it is und undesirable. And I feel like on the fish itself, um, the fish isn't going to be going through the happiest of life, you know. Like I said earlier, if it's looking completely down, if you hold that for about 10 seconds, there is immediate strain on the back of your eyes. So, yeah, um, not exactly 
not exactly um, comfortable with those kinds of practices. How we want things to be perfect was not comparing to Fisher's pain, hence why the non-naturalistic scapes are all high ranks in the IAPLC. Yeah. Okay. Differing views, uh, guys, so, you know, we'll, we'll try not to make this kind of like an argument, but, um, you know, I, I, do, I do get where you're coming from, uh, reasons why he's just trying to highlight um, the facts, which is, which is what I'm trying to do as well, just kind of highlighting the possibilities, the, the practices that happen, and then giving my view on them. Uh, that's why nature scapes and biotopes are very different. Yeah, especially the very open ones that can stress fish out. 100%. Uh, okay, so let's get into the next cosmetic or prevalent cosmetic practice that I see happening relatively recently with fish. Um, this one, I do want to kind of give a little bit of discretion because for some people it may be kind of a bit uncomfortable to look at. Uh, yeah, well, I'll just show you the picture. So. Uh, this one here, what we're going to have a look at, is a love heart or heart blood parrot. Now, you'll see one very striking thing that comes out with this fish. It's missing a tail. And this is not genetic. It is purely done for the simple aesthetic reason that a fish will look better swimming around like a blob without a tail. Do I think this is a completely disgusting view? 110%. I, I just the, the level of disgust and and I guess anger that I see when when I look at a photo like this, it, it really does disappoint me because we've got you know blood parrots go through enough as it is. They are man-made fish, they have enough genetic problems with them, like they can't close their mouth, compact body compact, like, disformed spine, a lot of issues with them. The fact that now you're making that fish's life even more terrible by cutting off its tail when it's a baby is, is completely terrible. Now, this honestly does not look like a love heart to me. Uh, and, yes, the fish literally cannot swim with its tail. It is just a blob that is moving like this without that streamlined beauty that we see that we want in our fish, you know, we, we, we want to see this, this natural way that they swim, but um, this is a, a very disgusting cosmetic practice which is done on aquarium fish. Um, now, when you look at this practice, like I said, when these fish are very young, when they fry, their tails are cut off. That can lead to a, a giant amount of problems. If you've got 10 of these normal blood parrots and you cut off their tail, I assure you that at least five or even more will die, usually through blood loss, secondary infection, um, stress, uh, sickness, a whole bunch of different things. So not only are you basically doing a suicide mission on these fish, you're putting their whole life, the rest of their life, through absolute hell, um, which is, you know, it, it's, it's a very disgusting practice. And... Yeah, it's it's just not good. Catching up on the chat, that just makes me want to cry. To think that a human would decide that a fish doesn't need its tail. I have a pair of blood parrots that I adore. Would not would not even think of doing that to them or any other fish for that matter. One hundred percent. And I feel like any caring owner of their fish would not want this to happen. So yeah, um, just not not a great practice and you know we can we can see that close up just how how dismembered this fish is the way that it's healed it's if you look at that there is no um biological way that this fish is benefited for survival you know when, when we aesthetics and stuff aside uh it's in terms of pure survival if you go on a trip for like a week and come back, this fish will 100% be dead. It'll have just tired itself out so much from barely being able to swim and using all of its energy, um, and it is completely, completely terrible. Now, 
you may notice something with this fish. The color is a lot more brighter than, I guess, one of the blood parrots like we saw before. Uh, now, this may not be 100% true with this picture, but the next disappointing cosmetic practice we're going to see that happens quite regularly with a lot of aquarium fish is dying. Now, I give me a second. Whew. Now, at first glance, when you see these fish or these fish, these are still blood parrots. It's mind blowing to see this sort of vibrant color that we'd never see in the wild or never see with a lot of fish. This beautiful, vibrant blues, greens, purples, pinks. But when the truth is revealed, these fish are actually. They died. They are literally taken as juveniles, dipped in a high concentrate dye that burns off their slime coat, which is the protective layer, the protective barrier of the fish. Like how we have skin, fish also have skin, but they also have this slime coat, which is another physical barrier on their body. This dye burns through that and will literally sink itself into the fish and result in permanent damage. Now, sure, I guess once the slime coat kind of heals back, the fish may be better, but during that time, it is susceptible to everything. Everything, infection, sickness, uh, stress, it die of stress, whole bunch of things. And as Reasons Why says, um, so basically dyed fish get infected easily 100%. The dye does not only stick to the external parts of their fish, but also everything inside. Once these fish are put in this 100% concentrated dye, it's going inside them. Their organs, everything inside their body is, is being changed into this one singular color. Uh, and it it is, again, purely for aesthetic reasons. There is no biological or survival benefit or living benefit that this fish is given through these cosmetic practices purely for aesthetic reasons. Uh, just doing a quick catch up on the chat. Indeed, okay, here's a thought. Is this different to breeding for long fins because they look more majestic and that inhibit movement in terms of mobility? 100%, this is similar to strain breeding or line breeding. However, that is a different topic with a couple of other aspects that I want to cover. Cosmetic practices is basically taking a, a normal fish or a proper fish and then physically manipulating it or changing it in order to achieve completely something different. Genetic breeding or line breeding and things like that is basically a slow and gradual progress of work that's done in order to change the fish generations and generations in, if that kind of makes sense. Uh, okay, Yoda, the force is strong with this one. Is is that my passion for fish? Because, yes, uh, my force is definitely strong. <laughs> Those look like glowfish. Yeah, uh, glowfish, however, it though it is... Cosmetic glowfish are more genetic. They took the ge the genes of a bioluminescent jellyfish and injected it into the uh, eggs or embryo of a um, of I guess a fi any fish in it. For example, a danio. They inject it into the embryo of a danio. So when that baby is born, it's bioluminescent. Also, it is going through genetic. Uh, I guess. It it's, travels genetically, so you're not having to inject this bioluminescent strain into every single batch of Daniels. Once it's in there, it's in there for generations to go. So, yeah. Nevea, again, I have a fire mouth, and as it turns out, it is classed as a false fire mouth. Does not make me want to run out and find a way to get the colors on it that are not there. 100%. And I guess... There is a practice that is done, which I haven't covered yet. Uh, I guess I should have done this earlier. There is a practice that is done with a lot of people in order to get 
Uh, and I, this is something I'm a little bit more comfortable with. See, if I was to get my Procox Rainbow, the one that you can just see behind my hand, and want it to look better in colors, there are two ethical things that I can do. Firstly is feeding them a high quality food. Extreme Aquatic Foods is a food that I swear by. It is, um, you know, I'm not sponsored or anything by them. It's just that this is the best food that I have ever fed my fish. The ingredients, the quality, and and everything that you see in this food is is healthy for the fish. So it's like if I was to eat hamburgers all day, every day, both my physical appearance and my health would completely deteriorate, you know. But by feeding, by having a proper diet, it ensures that my skin is good, my physique is good, um, uh, and and things like that. So and, and internally, I'm healthy. So feeding them a high quality food with good quality ingredients, like extreme aquatic foods, it changes them long term to make them look better. Is it cosmetic? No, because you're doing this naturally. It is a natural practice. And this is you giving proper care to your fish. So, and I noticed that instantly as well. When I, even after a week of feeding extreme aquatic foods, I found that my fish were acting better, swimming better, feeling better, looking better. So, um, just just giving them quality and care is is all that matters. So, yeah, uh, another thing that you can do is, lighting. Uh, lighting is something that we do for every aquarium just because we want to be able to see our fish. If you left your fish in complete darkness, they wouldn't be having a very happy life. So um, up top, I have a Fluval 3.0. Though it does look very bright through the the camera, um, it's, it's not as bad when you look at it in person. Uh, and that basically makes the environment of the fish that are living uh, brighter so they can see where they're going feel less scared, uh, feel more comfortable, and things like that. So lighting, natural LED, just basic LED lighting, nothing crazy like um, uh, UV or, or tanning lights. Natural LED lighting is, is, always, is always a good option. However, in doing so, there is always a negative. When we saw foods, there are also foods like this. This is White Crane's Color Enhancing Palette. Feeding this palette will 100% give you uh, noticeable differences in the long term. You will definitely see a difference in your fish because that's what it's designed for. It is designed to make your fish look more colorful. However, when you feed a food like White Crane regularly and often, it will often result in the fish becoming, one, sterile, meaning it can't breed. And that clearly already tells you that it's not healthy in any way, shape, or form. If it's inhibiting a fish from breeding, then or breeding, then it means that its health is compromised in some way or another. So foods like this probably don't have great ingredients, are filled with chemicals and isn't isn't good for, for fish at all doing a quick catch up on the chat uh hey hey how are you going budgie hello jason thank you for stopping by um we've been going for quite a fair while so um <laughs> you may have missed a little bit genetic now but they started out by injecting them yes uh with a lot of um yeah when it comes to tattooed fish and things like that genetic but then they go ahead and do more things to make an already biologically compromised fish even worse my view is that that it's just cruel there's enough natural beauty no need for this 110 percent completely agree with that statement hubby fish is a vibrant fish of course if you provide your fish with good water quality stable water quality a good environment not something that's only aesthetically pleasing, but also takes into the consideration the behavior, the comfortability, uh, and, and and I guess personal aspects of that fish, it will display proper colors. If I was to get all of these fish and put them in a completely bare bottom aquarium 
no scape, no decorations, nothing of that sort, I will 100% see that these fish will not have proper colours. They will be dull because it's not their environment. So going in a natural way, giving them a proper environment, you will notice that they will have better colours. Continuing on with the chat, uh, especially the foods that have a stacks like shrimp meal will help those red colours pop. Again, very sound statement. A stacks is a natural chemical that you'll find in foods that you eat like carrots, bell peppers, things like that. Um, uh, they will 100% have, uh, uh, what do you call it? They will 100% have proper natural, um, natural changes in your fish. Live foods, they are a great option. If you see any of the fish that Blake keeps on his channel, uh, or even, uh, even with Jason's, uh, cichlids, he feeds frozen, high quality, raw, frozen foods. Um, and Blake feeds a lot of live foods, when you feed those kinds of foods, you will definitely see a true change in your fish. They will look better, feel better, and, and you know, they'll do everything better. So, um, yeah, you, you'll definitely see. And even when you – I did a video recently where I fed my fish bloodworms for the first time ever, and the instant reactions that you see from these fish, insane. It is – they they completely went crazy. So, but we're talking about food now, not cosmetic practices. Okay. So, is that a food or a hormone? A stacsithin is a is a chemical. Uh, yeah. Oh, are we talking about white crane foods? Yes, white crane. Uh, like Jason is saying, it, it's it, it is it is a food. They claim that there are no hormones in the food. But there has to be. Female peacock cichlids end up looking like males after a few feeds. 110%. I would not be comfortable feeding that to my fish. If if it's having that much change, and the fact that it's, again, like I said, making them sterile, then clearly it is having a high negative biological effect on the fish. Yeah. So now that we've kind of gone into the food aspect of things, let's look back into another terrible cosmetic practice that Blake did kind of touch on before. Uh, but before that, so we saw dyed blood parrots and love heart blood parrots with their tail cut off. Both of them are terrible, and this is a mix that makes things even more terrible. You've got a biologically compromised fish, and you're making it even more terrible by putting it through a toxic, high concentrate dye, which affects it for the rest of, the life, for the rest of its life. Um, completely terrible stuff. Yeah, and one of, the, one of the things that Blake did say before is uh, tattooing. This, we don't see, I haven't seen it all in any Western countries or I guess especially in Australia, never seen this before. I don't think I've seen dyed fish in Australia as well before. I think that's just because of um, like a, a, an animal welfare practice that we have, which is very, very good in, in, in Australia. So completely uh, happy about that. But this you'll see is quite prevalent in a lot more parts of the world. This is basically where they get a fish and they will tattoo it. They will quite literally inject ink into the body of the fish. Um, again, what biological benefit does this have? None at all. And I will 110% assure you that these fish are not put through any, any form of anesthetic when they're being tattooed. It's just going to be a guy picking it up, tattoo gun, bang, 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 inject colours that's going into the skin, probably leaching into the bloodstream, the organs, and just a whole bunch of whole bunch of that stuff. So do I think this fish looks pretty? Would I keep this in an aquarium? Though it is a life, absolutely not. I, I would not keep this fish. I would not condone keeping this fish. It's it is very disturbing. It's it's sad to see, you know, when when you're like me that isn't into keeping aquariums as a hobby, for me, fish are a passion. I've 
the first thing I drew, first thing I said, first thing I ever wanted was a fish. So when you're someone like me that is truly passionate about fish and you see something like this, it gets you enraged, quite frankly. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's it's terrible to see this. And, yeah, these, these fish, again, like I said, will either, if you've got 10 of these fish, um, you've got 10 of these fish and you tattoo them, I assure you six to seven of them will probably die because of some form of sickness or illness or, you know, something of that sort, which is, it's it's saddening, you know. Uh, doing a quick catch-up of the chat. Ohio Fish Rescue, Rescue has some rescue tattoo fish. If, you know, again, I'm not exactly sure how I feel about that. By them rescuing it and then, I guess, showing it off on a YouTube channel, it promotes people that aren't exactly as well-versed as us to, I guess, get develop an interest for this fish. Um, but again, instead of euthanizing it, they are letting these fish live out their life in probably a good enclosure, home, aquarium, something of that sort. If people didn't buy them, then they would stop doing it 100%. And that is my main reason why I wanted to do this live stream, by educating people and letting them know about the cruel practices that go behind these um, behind these things. You know, if you saw, if, if a little kid saw um, a fish like this, they would be like, wow, that's so cool. And in their mind, they would just be thinking, this fish naturally has a smiley face on it. But I guess by... By trying to inform them and educate them, it lets them know that these fish are put through torment and sad, you know, they, they're, they're tortured, basically, in order to achieve this aesthetic, it's going to turn people off. So that's the main reason why I want to do more and more live streams that tackle more and more controversial topics of the aquarium hobby to fatten the livestock process into foods yep sadly they miss uh reasons why it says oh the chat just jumped there sadly they misinform people who enter the hobby and buy these poor fish exactly and um yeah if if people didn't buy them then the i don't even know the breeders of these fish the people that do this to the fish would Unfortunately, they would go out of a job. You know, people don't want these tattooed fish anymore. They wouldn't be doing them. They would just go to breed normal blood parrots and sell them. So, yeah, it is It is sad to see. Not to mention that, not to mention, like, the fish version of rainbow gravel. Exactly. It's like clown cube gravel. Um, yeah, if you wouldn't do that to your dog, don't do that to your fish. Exactly. Uh, yeah, as I was just about to say, some people do, uh, dye their dogs. You know, you, you, I assure you that you've probably seen some type of poodle that's been dyed bright pink or something like that. Yeah. Yep. Now, and I guess it's, uh, it, it comes to people proper people, especially with YouTube now, we're seeing a lot of these practices being unearthed, you know, people exposing the cruel things that go behind these practices. And if you see people like both Blake and Jason who are breeding high quality fish, um, Jason released a recent video where he was at a mate's place that was, um, had this beautiful fish wall in his garage. And that is the type of fish keeping that, I truly admire each of these fish have this specifically curated habitat, which brings out their behavior and their personality best by giving them a beautiful environment. It brings out their natural colors, their natural, um, their natural beauty. Uh, and even when you see Jason's beautiful cichlids, he isn't going there catching out his multifaciatus shell dwellers and tattooing brown stripes on them. That's by providing them shells, 
sandy substrate, giving them their that environment and water quality, natural colors are being expressed. Yeah, so always glad to see people tackling controversial topics, but I'm going to turn it in for the night in the US. Have a nice rest of the stream. Thank you very much for joining in. And again, uh, or not again, that actually does bring us to the end of this live stream. Let me take off this uh, horrendous picture of of that um, of that tattooed blood parrot. That does bring us to the end of this live stream. Uh, I really want to thank you guys for for watching and giving your input, sharing your views. It's uh, so great to see people that are actually wanting to see change, wanting to provide the best for their fish and. Um, I guess it's always great just to bring out these topics and talk about them uh, and I guess share them around to people that that may have unfortunately slipped into keeping these fish just because they haven't been educated um, and things like that. So really want to thank you guys for, for watching. Uh, another thing that I do want to quickly mention is that this five foot aquarium behind me is being broken down. I released a video today where I'm basically um, – uh, just put up some of the fish and the plants for sale. So if you guys are interested, make sure that you do check out that video. Uh, another thing I want to say is thank you so much for the people that are in the uh, – that are going to watch the replay. It truly means a lot to me that you've taken the time to watch this video. I believe it's one of the most educational videos that I've produced. I'm very happy with it, and hopefully you guys feel the same way. But, yeah, that does bring us to the end of this live stream. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, Matty D, goodbye. Uh, Nevaeh, thank you so much for your input. Blake, once again, thank you for helping me set up this live stream as well. Um, I couldn't have got these pictures up without Blake. Um, and Jason, thank you so much. Really love the work that you're putting out. So, yeah, awesome, guys. We're going to call it in for the night. Uh, have a good night, day, morning, wherever you're at. Um, again, thanks for the people that are watching in the replay. and. Yeah, stay happy, stay safe, stay as Australian, and broadcast bodgy.